Herzlich willkommen, uh, welcome to Red Bull Studios in Berlin and please welcome Dylan Katzen. Thank you. Um, the track we just heard, it's called Divine and Bright, and I think it was recorded in around 1990 or 1990. Yeah, yeah, that was our first recording session. Uh, uh, we did it in Portland, uh, back before Portlandia. Um, uh, Long before Portland. <laughs> But uh, it was at Smagma Studios, which was uh, Mike Lastra from the long-running uh, improv band Smagma. Uh, it was his home studio, basically. Um, it was a one-inch eight-track, um, and that was yeah. We uh, I had I was. Uh, <laughs> had recently moved back to Seattle from Olympia where I started Earth in 89 and uh, and then uh, Joe Preston who was in the band uh, was originally from Eugene, Oregon so he had a lot of I guess friends, connections, etc. in Oregon so that's why we ended up going down there and uh, also the price was right since it was three hundred dollars for the whole kit and caboodle. <laughs> so. Joe was in Melvins later, right? Yeah, he went to the Melvins and before that he was in a band called Snake Pit, um, from Eugene. I mean all these three places that you mentioned for people here, I suppose most people here are sort of based in Berlin. Um uh, Olympia, Seattle, and Portland are sort of all like two hours away from each other, right? Yeah, it's about yeah about an hour. Seattle's well, Olympia is about an hour from Seattle, and Portland's about three hours from Seattle. So, relatively close by American standards. <laughs> did you grow up around there? Did you move around a bit? Um, I was born in Seattle, but my dad worked for the Department of Defense, so we moved around. Uh, pretty much continuously um so i lived uh in uh philadelphia las cruces new mexico um ramstein germany augsburg germany wiesbaden germany um uh san antonio texas manalapan new jersey and then back to seattle and then i went back and forth between Seattle and Olympia a couple times. And then uh, my missing years were in Los Angeles and uh, then back to Seattle. <laughs> you say you, you, you formed Earth around 89 Olympia. Mm -hmm. um, at that time when you first started making music together, I mean, Earth has gone through so many different uh, variations or installations of the band, but the very first you getting together with, I think, four other guys, three, four other uh, guys at that time. That was uh, two, Slim Moon and Greg Babur. What was your, was there any, what was the mindset? Where did you want to go? Um, well, it was my third band, um, uh, so... Um, this one I had, I guess this one that was, I had, a, it was like sort of conceptualized before I started it. Um, <clears throat> my previous bands, uh, I guess, were less conceptual. Um, but um, this being the third time around, I had, you know, sort of specific things I wanted to do. Um, and uh, and um, so yeah, just I like set about to do those, and um, and then I guess that's. I mean, there's a number of reasons I've been through so many members. I guess um, just uh, you know, since I had the concept and the idea, and anything that didn't sort of you know, work with it, um, they or they left, you know, for other reasons, since, you know, everyone's life takes different paths, but... 
is in your mind is that a necessity for a really good band to have one person who's consistent and sort of the leader or do you believe in you know an equality among um i've seen very few bands that are like uh consensual that have worked for a long period of time um and then it seems like bands where there are t strong personalities um tend to break up and <laughs> they all go their own way um at least i mean that's just been mine my experience i guess um i mean that being said um But I'm not a control freak, and I'm not. Um, I don't like. I have strong ideas and a strong conception of what I'm doing and what I want to do. But within that, like when I get people to play with me, I get them because I like what they do and I figure what they are going to do is going to add to it and I let them do their thing. I don't, you know, I, n I never tell anybody like what to do or how to play something or, um, you know, anything like that. Um, just, I mean, if I didn't like what they did, I wouldn't work with them. So, and I don't, you know, that they're going to come up with ideas that I can't come up with and hopefully add to what's being made rather than, you know, me saying like, oh, no, the baseline has to be this or, you know, I mean, and like, you know, I would never tell like a trombone player what to play or a cello player what to play because <laughs> I have no concept of how those instruments work. So I have a hard enough time with my own side of things um uh t so so i mean it's it's open in a lot of ways but it's also i mean because i'm the main songwriter and the main guy i guess um sign the checks at the end of the day and all that um <laughs> But I, I generally try not to control people. It's like I'm not a control freak at all. I'm, I believe in what I call happy accidents and, and, and being able to like perceive those moments and not, you know, like, I mean, whenever you go into a studio to make an album, you know, you have a certain idea of how the album's going to come out and all this, but it's not going to be that by the time you get done with it. It's going to be something else um, as it makes its way into reality. And um, it's usually better than what you originally thought of um, because, you know, things happen that you can't plan or foresee. And... and um, And then people have their input and their parts and whatever they contribute, and and you can't come up with that either because you know you're not them, and they're not you. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> were there any? Was it an accident that there were no drums? On your first proper album? Um, no, that was. I mean, basically, I had, you know, being around other people doing bands and and a lot of other musicians, I saw people like constantly like, oh, when we find this guy, you know, when we find the perfect drummer, then we'll be ready, or when we find the perfect guitar player, then we'll be ready, and you know when we build the perfect practice space, then we'll be ready, or this, or, you know, always, like, waiting for something before they would get going. And um, to me, it was like, I, you know, I don't know if it's impatience or... Uh, but I was like, you know, I couldn't find a drummer um, at that time. For some reason, drummers were very hard to find in, in the... Seattle PNW area um, so I just you know figured I'd get a drum machine and you know deal with 
finding a drummer at some other point in time. Um, and then funnily enough, during my missing years in L.A., I met a bazillion drummers. <laughs> L.A. was crawling with drummers, but... Um, you weren't playing. But I wasn't playing, so... Um, but yeah, I just figured, like, you know, you do... To me, it's like you do what you can with whatever you have, um, and, and, you know, you don't, you know, wait for something that may not happen uh, otherwise it does it's not gonna you know you, you'll you'll never do it um <coughs> no you don't wait right in general if you have to do a thing you do it yeah no i mean i try to get stuff done uh um and i mean i don't know how people spend like years on an album <laughs> i mean one thing that the cost alone like they, i mean i guess that it, it must be luxurious to take you know seven years to do a record or ten years to do a record but um yeah i've never uh, had that luxury so um this uh first album that i mentioned earlier is kind of i think initially there was supposed to be another album before that but it somehow didn't happen but yeah, well, originally um, we recorded the album and uh, then we were approached by Sub Pop to do a seven inch, which is why that song uh, is split in two because it was going to be an A and B side of a seven inch. And then um, since there was a fabulous new device, the CD was just coming out at that time, they decided to do a, a CD EP of the two songs um, rather than a seven inch. So um, they ended up releasing the two songs on, on that. Um, and then the rest of the album was never released. So um, for and, those yeah. until uh, it was, well, it was bootlegged by Joe Preston first and then uh, <laughs> reissued by Southern Lord. He bootlegged his sort of stuff that he was involved himself. Um, well, actually, I mean, I probably, I don't know if I should go into it, but um, for some reason, well, I guess I'll just do it. Why not? Um, basically, um, for some reason, like basically, he got his dream come true, which was to join the Melvins, and then promptly got kicked out, and... Uh, and for some reason, because he couldn't strike back at Buzz, he decided I was the enemy. And so he went to Portland, stole the masters, and uh, started bootlegging the first Earth stuff. Um, and then also went to Sub Pop and got paid again for after being reimbursed for <laughs> what he had contributed to the recording costs. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why, but yeah, so that's <laughs> that's that what happened there. Um. <laughs> Since we're at uh, early '90s Seattle gossip, um, for those who don't know, which role did Sapo play in those years for the scene, sort of? Um, well, I mean, they were the local record label, and they, you know, um, Bruce and John, they were both very different. Um, uh, Bruce was, I would say, the more adventurous and risk-taking uh, side of the partnership, and and Jonathan was the more business-oriented member of the partnership. And then, uh, so our original relationship was with Bruce, um, and then. Uh, after they sold part of the company to uh, <clears throat> Warner Brothers, uh, Bruce basically retired from music um, and started pursuing other interests. And uh, but yeah, they I mean, they pretty much uh, are the reason Seattle is even noticed um, because they started out. Um, you know, they when they first started putting out bands like Mud Honey and stuff like that, they paid to, you know, fly 
journalists out to shows, especially English journalists, um, and uh, took bands to Australia and did stuff like that. Um, uh, so they really sort of, you know, created the whole, I guess, scene, as it were, and made it attractive to uh, major labels. Um, and then, I mean, I always felt we were tangential to all that. Um, I mean, it, uh, <clears throat> a lot, our, 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 I mean, it was like everything in life, you know, there's a two edged sword with good and bad. I mean, I'm grateful to have been on Sub Pop and gotten the chance to put stuff out because there's, you know, thousands of talented bands that never get to, um, although that's changing because of you know, production is in the hands of everyone now, but, um, uh, <clears throat> but like what we did was not, you know, grunge and not part of that whole thing. Um, so a lot of people, I think, that bought the records because they're saying Sub Pop expecting something were disappointed. And then a lot of people that, would have liked it, um, didn't buy it because they saw Sub Pop and expected something. Um, but, uh, and, you know, I mean, luckily I wore a Morbid Angel t-shirt on the back of an album, and so um, metal fans were sort of the first to really embrace what we were doing, and, and um, you know, uh, They've been, you know, consistent. I mean, metal metal fans are great in that they um, don't pay attention to trends. And if they love you, they love you flat out. Um, uh, and they're not necessarily <coughs> looking for the flavor of the month or um, whatever. So they're definitely like a really good core audience to, to have. Um, so maybe we should listen to a track of this then very first album that actually came out on Sub <laughs> Pop in 1993 this is uh, Seven Angels of Earth 2 this is Hello. Hey. This is, I think, 16 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we, can, we can fade so that. listen to it, two and a half. <laughs> um, I know that during this time that you were writing the record, you listened to but also read stuff that Lamonte Young was putting out, right? Well, I didn't... I was reading about Lamont Young. Um, finding his music uh, was much more difficult. Um, uh, luckily, the Gramma Vision, uh, for some insane reason, they were like a new age label of the time, uh, did put out a box set of his well-tuned piano, which was like five LPs, I think, or something like that. Um, and then they put out a CD of his B-flat blues band, uh, as he called it. Um, but it was mostly reading about Lamont Young and his concepts, I guess, that was that I found out about through, um, like probably most people, through the Velvet Underground. Um, um, and then uh, <clears throat> Terry Riley. Um, so... Um, when I formed the band, um, I guess my what I was listening to the most at that time would have been a um, uh, combination of uh, King Crimson, uh, 69 to 75, and then Slayer and uh, Minimalist Composers. Um, <laughs> So, um, but I mean, saying that too, I mean, like, I love all kinds of music. I mean, um, I guess they're, 
conceptually that was the the strongest influences I guess like that's why when I first started I sat down to play guitar instead of standing and um, you know I'm a bit of adolescent trip worship um, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah I mean you know growing up like you know I was exposed to a lot of music by my parents because they were you know of the, you know, I was born in 1968, so, um, you know, a product of the summer of love, I guess you could say. Um, uh, so my parents were, you know, into music and stuff since they were young when they had us. Um, but, um, and then when I discovered music for myself and was able to buy my own records, I gravitated, I mean, ACDC is what started this all. Um, hearing hearing them is what got me into music and wanted wanting to play music and uh be a rock and roll star um <laughs> but uh um but yeah um i i always thought like when i would hear a song and like there'd be a cool riff or a cool part of the song I was always like oh it, what would it be like if they stayed on that instead of like moving on to the next part um uh and then I read about you know minimalism and stuff like that and was like oh like okay what if we take you know a Slayer style riff and play it for 20 minutes at half speed um so I guess you could say um, that was my one good idea, and I recognized it and ran with it. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, and then, you know, later discovered, like, you know, Indian music and, and stuff like that. And, um, I don't know, maybe... I, since I have Scottish heritage, it's some kind of atavistic bagpipe thing. Um, but um, I've always been drawn to stuff that's like repetitive and and uh, uh, you know, I guess on the slower side of the tempo. Uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So and then Earth Two. Uh, sort of came about um, there was the con like again there earth was very conceptual in the early days um, uh, like the again the wonderful new invention of the CD opened up at the time however long 73 minutes um, I know they're longer now but at the time that was 70 that was the length so we were like oh let's fill up an entire CD with you know one song in three parts. Um, obviously, tape didn't contribute to that because, you know, they only got 30 minutes max uh, on recording tape back then. So, you know, we had to sort of, you know, splice it <laughs> or, you know, you know, fade it in and fade up and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, nowadays with Pro Tools, you could conceivably, you know, make an endless record. <laughs> um, but Or do John Cage pieces for 600 years. What? Or do a con John Cage did a piece for yeah. 600 years. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> in case you don't know, it's a... In a church in Germany, actually, I think an hour south from here, mm. but it's like only a new tone every two or three years. So, mm. but it's announced usually, so you can see that. Mm. Um, when you when you say you were very conceptual in those early years, and you talked about Lamont Young and Indian music, um, were you conceptual when it comes to scales and tuning as well? Because both Lamont Young and Indian music do. Um, I mean. <laughs> I never did just intonation or anything like that. I mean, I always worked with standard uh, guitars. Um, you know, later the companies started making fretless guitars and just intonated fretboards and all that kind of stuff. But by then, you know, um, I sort of moved on and 
again, it was always like, I'm going to work with what I have. And what I had was a regular guitar. Um, uh, back then, I used to tune much lower. Um, and then, you know, I realized, like, you know, Hendrix did E flat and he did, per, you know, I mean, I defy anyone to come up with heavier riffs than that. And then Tony Aomi, you know, dropped a half, st you know, dropped a whole step to D and used the thinnest strings because of his fingers. So it's like, it's not about how low the guitar is tuned or how many, you know, if you have seven or eight or nine strings now or, you know, it's like this whole kind of... I mean, Earth sort of was like a response to at the time everyone was trying to be like the fastest band on Earth. So we were like, oh, we're going to be slow. But like, again, if you take something like that and make it the focus, then it's like you're turning music into sport. You know, it's like... Oh, and then, you know, now there's bands like, oh, we're the slowest band or we're the t lowest tune band or, you know, where the, it's like, it's like they forget it's all about music originally and it shouldn't be like about like, uh, you know, these things um, because then you're not paying attention to the music. You're just worrying about like something else, um, you know. Uh, so. How much is your own composition and strategy about just listening to your instrument? <coughs> well, I mean, I think you have to listen to your instrument. Um, I mean, it's like you're, it's a... <laughs> You know, you're, it's a symbiotic relationship, ho hopefully, maybe some would say parasitic, but, um, you know, and uh, I mean, ultimately, it's about being able to transfer what's coming through you through this. Um, so, you know, it's listening to that. Um, you know, wherever music comes from, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it comes through people and then it takes the form it does because it's coming through those people and through a certain instrument. So, um, uh, you know, it's like you have to, um, listen to it, I guess. Um, but then not, I mean, the goal is obviously to be able to transcend whatever instrument you're playing at the same time and make it deliver the music as effectively as possible. Um, so. I'm kind of asking that because uh, I know you once said, and I quite like that idea, that if you don't play different notes, so basically you play drones, that allows you to listen to what is happening inside this one note. Yeah, I mean, you the b because of the way the human ear is built, you you um, you know the overtone series begins to create melodies that aren't technically there and then there's a note that it produces that's like an artificial it's like a, a it's a tonic that's not there you know technically like if you analyzed it with a you know frequency analyzer or whatever they use for that kind of stuff but um but yeah i mean uh the human ear produces melodies of its own in response to uh, the overtone series uh, being produced. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I think there's that. I mean, 
<clears throat> everything in the universe is vibrating, um, you know, like like quantum mechanics is like showing us that you know basically everything's uh, a waveform. You know, even particles are actually like you know waveforms or they're you know or in string theory they're vibrating strings or whatever. But um, everything's like a vibrational energy. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense that that's why we make music and why we're drawn to music and, and, and why it affects us because it's like, it vibrates us physically and then, you know, down to the molecular level. And I mean, it's why like musical instruments, the more they're played, the better they sound because the vibrations organize the molecules of the instrument. Whereas like instruments that are like locked away is like and you know enshrined and whatnot you usually sound horrible because they haven't been played and that's what they're meant for. Um, not to be like you know put in a museum and shut away and hoarded and <laughs> stuff. So. Talking about all this, I would kind of assume that you would have gone into just intonation, but you didn't, right? Why is that? Um, or maybe we should explain what it is. Uh, um, it's a basically it's a other way of intonating an instrument um, when you, all notes are based on a ratio of of numbers and there's this little thing called the Pythagorean interval that messes everything up and so it's basically what do you do with this and so conventional western music which is called equal temperament they take that and they divide it up amongst the notes and so that's why we have a 12 note scale um, but other intonation systems have done it different ways and then you have like Arabic and Persian scales with quarter tones and stuff like that so um, they, they have other ways of dealing with it um, but um, I mean mostly I guess you mostly I guess like I moved on from that I guess and like it's to me like I said it's about making music with what I have and um, most of those instruments are prohibitively expensive <laughs> um, and then again my I didn't really see the need to do that I mean I moved um, I mean I've kept I mean, I still love open strings and, you know, what they call oblique motion, which is dr the drone basically is the, the simplest form, or not simplest, but is a form of oblique motion where you have one note going while other notes move against it. Um, and it's perfect, I've, it's perfectly able to do it with conventional instruments. Um, and uh, and then there's things that you can do with conventional instruments you can't do with justly intonated instruments and um, yeah so uh, is oblique motion a thing that you could show with just this one guitar? Yeah, I mean it's pretty simple. Like, uh, I like simple things. <laughs> things might be simple, but still new to people. I mean, that's the 
I guess, like, the oblique motion is, like, because the E is constantly going and then I'm playing other notes that move against it, so, like, you know, I mean, a lot of, like, metal is, like, oblique motion because they're, like, the open string or, like, you know, like, Ouroboros is broken. Thanks. A very fast version of that song. Uh. <laughs> How are your fingers doing? What? How are your fingers doing uh, all those years? They're fine. I mean, uh, I early in my career, um, before I had one, uh, I had carpal tunnel syndrome and had to have an operation on my left wrist, but um, yeah, I haven't had any problems since then. So, um, I mean, you, you know, the more you play, the stronger your fingers get, unless, you know, you have an unfortunate accident or strain them or, you know, somehow mess them up. But um, I've luckily managed to avoid that. So, um. I think you should listen to a track from sort of the last album before a long hiatus. Before you said you got you got lost in LA. <laughs> 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 this Tibetan quarlutz. <laughs> It was a remix of the same song um, of Tibetan Qualudes and the remix was by Russell Haswell and I think came out exactly 10 years after. So yeah, um, that was, uh, the remix album was uh, we had, when I had just sort of started uh, doing Earth again. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd actually there'd been actually a couple of remixes done uh, when I was on Sub Pop um, uh, by DJ Spooky, um, and then Russell Haswell was someone I met the first time uh, I came to England uh, in 1995 because um, we got brought over by uh, Paul Smith from. Uh, blast first, and uh, uh, Bruce Gilbert, uh, who was doing a thing, DJ Bumblebee, liked to use uh, Earth 2, apparently, as part of his records that he was DJing. But, um, yeah, apparently uh, we had acqu acquired <laughs> um, a following amongst like I guess like the noisier end of electronic music uh, folks um, and uh, and so and like I was do started doing Earth again uh, before there was any new material out uh, no quarter records decided to do a remix album of inviting electronic musicians like uh, Russell and Altecra and uh, DJ Spooky and some other folks to uh, mangle uh, <laughs> some uh, earth songs. So, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Tibetan Quaaludes is like, I guess one of the, I mean, it's got one of the most, I guess, dissonant songs I've done. Um, but I guess in, in addition to oblique motion, uh, another thing I've always liked is sort of the contrast between like dissonance and consonance. Um, uh, 
and that's a fairly extreme example of it since it was like uh, back in the day. Um, <laughs> uh, back in the day, you mean before your hiatus? Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, phase three album that sort of almost didn't happen um, and had a number of problems seeing the light of day, um, which are, uh, is sort of what led to the hiatus. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, so. Uh, so you did actually not play guitar for those eight, nine years? Or did you, do you always play? No, I, when I moved to LA, I did not own a guitar and uh, uh, didn't play a guitar. Uh, well, it wasn't eight or nine years. It was actually, um, I mean, I was in LA for four years and then um, I started playing again about 2001, 2002. Um, uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> then I mean, we didn't really have a label or anything like that until uh, Southern Lord uh, signed us in two thousand five. With and we did Hex. Um, before that, we'd done. There'd been some reissues and and a live record um, done by various uh, shysters. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, the No Quarter guy was a good guy and th they were uh, nice people, nice guy to work with and a good label, but uh, the one label that we, well, label, um, <laughs> uh, that we worked with in the ver right when we came back was uh, sort of a disaster. Um, the guy was like a con man. Uh, and was selling a non-existent computer repeatedly on eBay to generate income, and later went to prison for wire fraud. Um, but, um, that's I a always whole wondered who those people nother. are who do that. So that's you. <laughs> so that was like a whole. No, I didn't do that. That's uh, that was the guy that was oh, supposedly right. our label. Um, uh, so. Um, but yeah, that's a whole nother saga that to we don't need to go into. Yeah, <laughs> to to talk about a label that um, I think you still have a very good uh, relationship with. Um, you mentioned Southern Lord, which mm -hmm. is the label of Greg Anderson of Sun, who are famously, um, apparently named after one of your releases sun amps and smash guitars or are yeah. named after, after the amps, the amps yeah yeah <laughs> how how was that first contact so at the end around 2001 when you started playing guitar again and started um, playing with a drummer etc um i actually met greg when i was in la um he invited me to a goat snake show um and then we just sort of kept in contact uh over the years and then um, he invited us, uh, he had like a little showcase night at uh, South by Southwest uh, in 2003 I think it was and invited us to play at it and then that's when we decided to start uh, working together. Um, and as I said up to that time it had been a number of small labels and so-called labels that we had worked with that hadn't worked out very well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then uh, we went in the studio and uh, did Hex. Um, I mean, I got a guitar again, like I said, about 2001. And I originally just started playing to play again. I had no... Uh, no plans to restart Earth or even do like a band again or play live or record. It was just more I want, wanted to play guitar again. Um, and then I uh, started uh, drumming, or I met Adrian, and uh, we started playing together and 
and eventually sort of morphed into uh, stuff, you know, music. Um, <laughs> after a, a period of what I call therapy music, um, we actually, I started, you know, uh, writing again and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, even though it, I mean, I've never wanted to make the same album over and over again. I've always, I've never understood that mentality. Um, to me, it's like an album is, a represents a specific period of time and a specific set of circumstances. Um, and you can't recreate it, and so there's really no point in trying to recreate it. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of people that, you know, they have a successful album, and so they think, oh, I, we've got the formula, and they repeat it ad, ad nauseum. Um, Coldplay. Um, but, uh... <laughs> but, um... Uh... I've never thought that way. I've always wanted to do, I mean, as you grow and change as a musician, you want to grow and change as a recording artist um, and do different things and try, you know, um, you know, I mean, you know, you have different concepts for a record and, um, you know, uh, I mean, to me, that's always been important. Um, uh, not only should a song have an arc, but the album should also have an arc. Um, and um, every album's different and has a different set of circumstances. You know, it's a period of time that won't be the same, and you're preserving it, kind of, um, unlike the live experience where it's like, a period, it's a moment in time that will never be repeated and is not being preserved. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, I've always, you know, it's a luxury to get to go into a recording studio and, and work on stuff. So, um, you, I, you know, it's a, a time to, to try and do your, best work and 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 do something you know different and and, and experiment um, so for this album that then came out hex you as you just said you introduced that adrian said that mm -hmm. you met adrian davis who played drums with you for a couple of albums how how did that change you to work with a drummer as earth for the first time um well um it was i guess i mean i'd worked with a drummer on penistar um i mean it was it made my life easier in some respects because i didn't have to program a drum machine anymore and then um obviously it, you know you're working with another musician so they're contributing something that you can't or, um, you know, uh, you know, um, I mean, I'd worked with drummers in the two bands I was in before, so, you know, I mean, it was natural, I mean, it didn't, it wasn't strange. I'd never been opposed to having a drummer, it would had just always been difficult to find one, um, so. Let me let me maybe put it differently. You mentioned consonance and dissonance before. Would you, especially in this duo setup of Adrian and you, would you ever approach a duo setup as one person being the dissonant one and one being the consonant one, mm, no. aiming at resolution? No, at, yeah. I mean everyone. I mean, I mean drums to me are not. I mean they're melodic but in a different way than uh you know a guitar or a cello or whatever um but they're you know rhythmic uh 
and then sometimes timekeeping and sometimes not. And uh, I mean, they're a, they're a timbre and color instrument that adds something uh, and, and holds things together, together, I guess, is the way I look at it. Um, but it's not, drums to me aren't consonant or dissonant. They, they're, you know, their own thing, I guess. Um, I mean, unless there's tuned percussion, like say a tabla, which is like melodic or uh, tuned, you know, cymbals or bells and stuff like that, that can be melodic um, or harmonic, like a vibraphone or something. But, you know, drums in of themselves, I don't consider that way, I guess. You started touring, I think even Russell has well had to set up a, an early tour, is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you started touring around that time. How how did that feed back into the tracks that you made? Um, well, I began to write a lot of stuff while we were touring, and I would, like, work. I mean, it's sort of like work on songs in a live situation and introduce songs in a live situation. Um, um, and then, you know, um, we'd always, I mean, we kind of always would play new stuff on tour um, as well as the stuff on the album that we were touring on. We'd always like have new stuff to play that for the next album, hopefully, you know. Um, so, so yeah, that I, I guess that's sort of the biggest. What's the biggest change is not just writing at home and then recording. It was like, from like you know, showing stuff to the audience before it was finished. There's another sort of double album that you did, uh, Angels of Darkness, um, Demons of Light, and I want to listen to a track of that. And I want to listen to a track that I think was specifically not improvised, but composed, which is... Yeah. I could let this run forever. <laughs> Um, so as I said, this was a composed track. Um, mm -hmm. How maybe you want to explain in this in this specific session? How would you move on from that having like one composed track as an opener? Well, I mean that the arc of the album was uh, from composed, like the most composed track the open the record to the ending track, which was completely improvised in the studio. Um, so that was sort of the arc of that uh, session. Um, um, and then um, I composed Old Black. Um, like I, when I'm writing, like I sometimes will like set little like I don't know, jobs for myself or, or like try something like that I haven't done before. Like, so like that specific song, um, like, oh, I'm going to write in a minor key and I want to do like a traditional structure, uh, A, B, A, B, C, um, I believe is how it comes out um so it's like a you know verse chorus verse chorus and then an outro um uh so that's sort of how that song um uh originated i guess you could say um that and like uh yeah i mean that that was sort of it, it was a little task I had set myself songwriting um, and then um, like I said that the Angels of Darkness albums um, were recorded all at the same time um, 
both albums, um, but there was like too much to do just one record. Um, and um, I mean, it kind of came about, I had uh, uh, had liver failure and was diagnosed with uh, hepatitis B wild type. And so um, uh, I booked <laughs> a two week tour with Walls of, Throne, of the Throne Room and went into the studio afterwards. Um, but uh, it was sort of like, I wasn't sure if that was going to be it uh, for both Earth and myself. Um, so it, turned into a very productive session um, and we did a lot of material especially with all the improvising um, which uh, um, I credit uh, Lori Goldston a lot with helping me with that she's um, an amazing cello player and an amazing musician period um, uh, probably the most formidable musician, all-around musician I know, um, I would say. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, again, like when I was talking about albums having an arc, that was the arc of that project, um, was to, because there were some composed songs that I had uh, worked on on the tour with the wolves, and then we would also improvise quite a bit uh, every night. Um, uh, I mean, the impro improvising part sort of started with uh, the Bees Made Honey album. Um, I was listening to a lot of uh, jazz stuff, I guess, and uh, I'm a self-confessed, uh, Deadhead, um, so um, and that was one of the things I always loved about the Grateful Dead was their improvisatory nature and the fact that none of their live shows were the same, um, and none of the songs were the same night after night. Um, uh, which I mean, uh, that's the way I look at the live thing. I've never understood the concept of like, oh, we're going to try and recreate an album on stage. It's like, um, I mean, to me, I would just go mad. Um, it would drive me crazy. And then also the fact that if I want to hear the record, I will play the record. That's why it was recorded. And, you know, like just put the record on and <laughs> lip sync um, or, or <laughs> pretend to play if they want to recreate it live. Um, night after night, um, whereas to me, like I've always thought, like live. I mean, what I love about the live experience is that it's not the same, and it's always different. It's different every night, even if you're playing the same songs. It's different every night, and um, and uh, I've always tried to leave, especially well, especially since the Bees album always try to leave moments where improvisation is possible or required. Um, um, <clears throat> Cause I mean, that's, that's what's exciting about the live thing is like you and an audience are coming together to create this moment that will never happen again. And, and the song will never be played the same way again. And, um, and, you know, you're opening yourself up to music and letting music dictate what's happening. Um, what would be other compositional tasks or challenges that you set up for yourself? Um, or maybe even, you know, may maybe you would uh, suggest for people to set up specific ones? Um, I never suggest them to other people. I mean, like I said, I do the bulk of the songwriting when there is songwriting. And then even like in the improvisatory tracks, I'll um, usually come up with the riffs or whatever that are going to be used for that. Um, the, like one of the exceptions was the Angels of Darkness, Demons of Light track, which was just like we rolled tape and, you know, 
started playing. Um, I don't know, it's usually stuff like, you know, like, oh, I'll try something that's like conventional songwriting, like, you know, um, or so-called conventional songwriting, like just trying structures that are, you know, like something that's, you know, a recognized way of doing something, I guess, like, um, so I guess that would be it, or, you know, like, oh, I want to try and do a piece that does this, or a piece that does that, or does this evoke this, you know, like, I want to do a quiet piece, or, you know, stuff, I mean, I mean, they only really, like, I don't know, they're like tasks in my head, but, you know, I guess to a lot of people, they're just whatever songwriting, but, um, yeah. Another album you did uh, after this, Primitive and Deadly, and I think it was first conceived, or parts of it were first conceived uh, for your solo project, and to talk about your solo project. We have to talk about Albion and I think it's maybe mostly Germans are in this room. <laughs> Not all people would know what Albion stands for. What does it? Um, Albion is an old name uh, for England. Um, it's also kind of a name that conno connotates like the mythic Britain or uh, magic, magical Britain. Um, uh, so, yeah, it comes from, I mean, the original name for the island was White Alba, Latin for white, because of the cliffs um, of Dover, and uh, I guess also because of all the mist. Um, uh, but, yeah, after, well, I guess it was during Angels of Darkness, really, um, I was listening to a lot of uh, English folk rock bands like, you know, uh, the Pentangle and Fairport Convention and Mr. Fox. And um, I guess I'm primarily of, you know, English and Scottish extraction um, with a heavy dose of uh, Swedish and Finn in there as well. But um, I don't know if the like being near my end made me think about my roots or something like that. But um, uh, I'd always liked, uh, my grandmother came from Scotland right after the war to America. And so when we lived in Germany, we would visit relatives uh, in Scotland. And, and so I'd been to England a number of times and always enjoyed it. And then, when I was touring extensively, um, uh, once Earth was going again, we played in England a lot. Um, that was sort of our first, I guess, the first country outside the U.S. that really embraced us. Um, uh, and I've always liked it there, and uh, I've been into the history and. And then uh, I got into history and occult folklore of the island. And so I started doing, I didn't want that because that influenced the Angels records. I didn't want Earth to be tied to that so that Earth could change and do its thing um, album to album. Um, so I started a solo project that was devoted to that uh, and where you would do field recordings? Um, that, I mean, that was like I was recording uh, environmental sounds, I guess. Um, I mean, it was on a trip for a specific purpose. Um, uh, but, I mean, none of them were turned out to be usable, so... Um, uh, do you mind explaining what psychogeography is? 
Well, um, I guess psychogeography is a term. I mean, I'm not that familiar with the term um, myself, but uh, it was a term coined by the writer Ian Sinclair. Um, or I think he coined the term, or maybe the critics coined the term to describe what he does, or I don't know, but um, uh, apparently it's um, like being open to the psychic influences of uh, geographical locations and perceiving the sort of different time periods that occupied that part of space-time, um, I guess is the concept. And you once had a spiritual encounter in Camden, is that right? Or is it something you don't talk about? Yeah, it's not really something I talk about. Um, I mean, I had personal experiences of a supernatural nature, I guess, or, and, and that's what spurred on the the project, I guess uh, that's what I'll say. Um, uh, it's been a long time completing the project um, and everyone's been really patient, for which I'm grateful. Um, I still have the last part of the project to complete, which is the book, um, which is written. It's just uh, now figuring out how to get it published um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the uh, album and DVD um, are out and um, have been delivered. So um, that's the last part of the project. And that will explain more um, about what inspired the project. And uh, I was going to play a track of Falling with a Thousand Stars. Um, mm -hmm. Does that make any, do you want any, any specific one? No, you can choose. This is uh, Raynard the Fox. <laughs> All right, um, time has come for any of you to ask questions. If you like to, there's going to be a mic that is, um, we're going to try to uh, pass around if the cable allows. Um, is there anyone who wants to start? You all look at me, you need to look at mic person. Okay, then I'm just starting. So how did this collaboration came about and uh, with uh, the back and what is your, uh, yeah, what is the process of working with each other? Um, uh, it came about um, through um, a mutual friend of ours, uh, the artist Simon Fowler, um, who's done covers for Earth and uh, for The Bug and other bands, um, as well as lots of other art. Um, but um, he asked me if I wanted to do some guitar um, for these two 12 inches. Um, uh, and so um, basically he sent me the the basic tracks and I uh, recorded guitar parts um, uh, and then uh, sent them back and then he edited and did whatever he does um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, yeah that's sort of how it worked and then um, mm -hmm. we have a full-length album coming out um, this year, um, uh, and that one, I guess, worked a little different in that uh, uh, we did a show together in Los Angeles, and so since we were there, um, I went into the studio and uh, played guitar tracks um, and a couple multi-tracks. Um, on stuff that he was working on. Um, and we were actually in the studio together for that one. Um, uh, but then again, he takes them back and, and, and uh, 
fiddles with them until uh, he likes them, I guess, and then <laughs> releases them. <laughs> Ah, okay, thanks. So, how does the, how does it differ for you if you are working like by email, like lots of people do nowadays, or like being in a studio with somebody? Because I always think there's some some magic happening. You can't just convey with this email process. Yeah, I mean, I've never. I mean, I'm. I don't. I have yet to master a digital uh, audio uh, recording technology um so i'm i you know i'm kind of a dinosaur and have to use a studio um <laughs> and have someone else twiddle the knobs for me um uh so yeah i mean that's i mean i guess that's the closest i've come to that sort of working together i mean i'd like to um i i'm I'd like to learn how to use uh, digital recording stuff. Um, and, I mean, mix it with some analog outboard gear and stuff like that. But um, just so I can do uh, stuff on my own and not be tied to studios and 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 stuff like that, just because uh, the costs of studios are increasingly prohibitive although that said there are also plenty of small studios that are not expensive and and uh they do great work um and need support so i you know uh, i certainly hope people will continue to use uh studios as well as uh their laptops um but uh yeah i mean i it seems weird to me that kind of like long distance sort of collaboration um i mean i guess it probably works well for some people um i like to i mean i think it's nice it's always nice when it's like face to face interaction um rather than uh remote uh interaction um so I mean, there's some. I mean, it's like playing live, you know. I mean, technically, we could all stay home and watch a band on Skype, but um, and maybe that's the future. I don't know. Um, uh, but it's you know, there's something to be said for being all in the same environment and at the same moment, uh, interacting uh, with one another that can't really be replicated. Um, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I um, uh, wanted to ask if you were ever planning to sing on record again. Um, I don't have any plans to. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> I never discount anything. Um, but yeah, there's no no plans to at the moment. Um, I haven't practiced in a long, long time, and even when I did, I was not a vocalist of note. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. And uh, when you're home and you play guitar on your own, mm -hmm. <coughs> no one's listening to you. What uh, music do you play? Um. Right now, um, I'm. I've been uh, going through a book on uh, like R and B guitar and a book on Bill Evans' uh, songs for guitar. So I guess uh, jazz and R and B. <laughs> It's all about uh, the front question. row today. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, what? What is your preferred uh, guitar tuning? Do you play standard? I just um, it's standard, dropped a half step, E flat, uh, Hendrix tuning. So that's, that's it. That's it. Someone else. Are there any 
Hello? Are there any plans for a new uh, Earth record? Um, yeah, we don't... I mean, I've been writing material. Um, we don't have a recording date set or any of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, as we're... <coughs> um, our contract with Southern Lord ended, so... Um, uh, not sure yet where it's going to uh, find a home. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, hopefully, get recording sometime this year. So, if there's no one else, uh, do you want to let people out with some of that jazz or R and B? Cool. Um, but maybe before that. Thank you. <laughs>